Gosh, well, I, I love that second worship song we sang today that is based on some of the words in the Sermon on the Mount. And how many of you can testify that some rain came, some winds blew, but you're still standing because of Jesus Christ? You're still here because of Jesus. You're still making it through. I know I can sing that, and, I, and I'm happy to proclaim that because that is absolutely true. And it's why we're teaching through this series on the Sermon on the Mount. Because it's not just building our lives on the person of Jesus, but it's also building our lives on his teachings. Those who put his teachings into practice are those who are building their house on the rock. And this morning we're looking at some of Jesus' most famous words on money and possessions. And he taught on this topic pretty much more than anything else uh, in his ministry. Because how we spend and how we store our money and our possessions, these are some of the most important things in your life, both now and forever. And last week, I said that Jesus' words on fasting, I, I believe, today are the most disregarded of all of the things he said in the Sermon on the Mount. However, John Wesley, that great Anglican priest and revivalist of the 18th century, in his day, he believed that these words were the most disregarded, saying that not one in 500 Christians actually live this out. He said that the Christians of his day had no instruction at all concerning it, unless it were this, to break it as soon and as much as they could, and to continue breaking it until their lives end. Ouch. (laughs) In other words, in Wesley's day, most Christians just kept storing up treasure on earth until they die. And this is dangerous. Because instead of storing up treasure in heaven, which is eternal, we're in danger of storing up the judgment of hell. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, the greedy will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you live a life that stores up treasures on earth, if you live a life of greed, the Bible says, Jesus says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm trying to wake you up to this danger a little bit. I'm trying to shock you with what Jesus and the Bible actually say about this subject. Because we typically, I think, we don't view greed as all that dangerous. Probably because the devil is a great liar. And also because there's something interesting that the the way that money works on our souls, it blinds us in many respects. Jesus refers to this as the deceitfulness of wealth. There's something about wealth that is deceitful. And I think it's like that wives' tale about the the frog in the water. You know, you put the frog in room temperature water, and you just let it slowly heat up. The frog doesn't even notice. And before it's too late, the frog is is dead because it's in a pot of boiling water. Friends, in our wealthy society, I believe we've been put in a pot of boiling water. The standard of living around us and our own standard of living, it can just slowly creep up and up and up. And before it's too late, we've stored most of our treasure on earth rather than in heaven. We can fall under the judgment of Almighty God because we've made the so-called Almighty Dollar our God instead. So today, let's realize, because of the world that we live in, because of where we live, we are in a pot of boiling hot water, and we need to jump out before it's too late. But friends, I have good news for you. Jesus is the greatest moral teacher who's ever lived. And if you put his, his teaching into practice, you will find hope and peace and joy. And he gives us three wise counsels to defeat the God of greed and to live joyfully in his kingdom. So we'll look at those three counsels he gives us. The first one is this. We need to move move your treasure from earth to heaven. Move your treasure from earth to heaven. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles or on your phone this morning, it's Matthew 6, beginning in verse 19. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So essentially, Jesus compares two different types of storing. Storing treasure on earth versus storing treasure in heaven. And the main difference between the two that he highlights is what is going to last 
Treasures on earth are temporary and don't last. Treasures in heaven last forever. They're, etern- they're eternal. Jesus points out that treasures on earth, they're subject to decay. Uh, you know, many wealth was stored in expensive clothing and moths could destroy that. Vermin could eat up the grain that was stored up in their grain houses. Thieves could easily break into their houses of clay. Now today, we have a lot more ways of storing our wealth much more securely, do we not? And for that reason, I think it is even easier to set our hearts on treasures on earth because we can store them much more successfully than people could 2,000 years ago. And so I say to you, is it not then, how much more important is it to shift our perspective when it's that much easier to store treasures on earth? We've got to take this even more seriously than the time of Jesus because we can store our wealth so much better. But even if you could secure your, your, your earthly wealth from all loss, we know we cannot take it with us into eternity. Our earthly wealth will do us no good when we die. Randy Elkhorn says, May what will be most important to us five minutes after we die, may that become most important to us right now. Will your earthly possessions matter at all to you in heaven? Will what's in your bank account matter at all when you're in heaven? I think the moment we enter eternity, we are likely going to realize how foolish we were for focusing on things that were so temporary that in the light of eternity, it looks like it's a blip on the radar. Why was I so caught up in that? If only we could wake up now and realize how meaningless meaningless it all will be in comparison to eternity. If only God could wake us up to see how important, important it is to store treasure in heaven. But the good, news, the good news is I believe Jesus has given us what we need if, if we're willing to listen, if we're willing to change our perspective and change how we steward money, then we can find hope and put our, our treasure in heaven instead. Now, we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about living a life God rewards. Now, some Christians might have trouble with this concept. It might be a little uncomfortable, but Dale, scholar Dale Ellison says this, For Jesus, the issue was not whether there would or even should be reward. For Jesus, the issue was whose reward matters, man's or God's. Or we might say earthly rewards or heavenly rewards. Which one do you want? Which one are you living for? God gives you the choice. God allows you to decide where do you want to invest more. Now, I presume that most of you, you want to shift your treasure from earth to heaven because I know you and I know how you live. I know you want this. So how do we do it? How do we shift our treasure from earth to heaven? How can we invest in what will ultimately matter in eternity? Well, I believe Jesus agrees with the standard Jewish tradition that what we spend on the needs of others will be rewarded by God. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Now this is confirmed by a teaching that Jesus gives in a parallel passage in the Gospel of Luke. Let's put this up. Jesus says, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven, see how it's connected? A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no no moth destroys. So friends, we move our treasure into heaven when we move our earthly treasure into the hands of those in need. That's how we do it. You move your earthly treasure into the hands of those in need, and that's how it's stored up in heaven. Randy Elkhorn says you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And what we don't send ahead, it ultimately gets lost forever. And as we take this action, as we begin to do this, as we begin to move where we're investing, our hearts begin to change. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the more you invest on things here, the more you invest in material things here, the more your heart will be attached to the things of this world. But the converse is true. You can find freedom that the more you invest in the things of heaven, the more you give money away, the more that you help the poor in the world, your heart will grow 
And I think about the Grinch right now. Your heart will grow three times as large. As you give it away, your heart will be more focused on things above rather than things below. Where you put your treasure not only changes your heart, it also reveals it, right? So you have to ask yourself, how am I doing when it comes to greed? Where am I putting my treasure? Is it in more stuff or more accounts here? Or is it into the hands of the poor and needy? So the first counsel Jesus gives is, hey, move it. Move your treasure from earth to heaven. Move it. But to that end, we need Jesus' second point, which is this. Close your eyes to greed and open your eyes to the needs of others. Close your eyes to greed and open your eyes to the needs of others. Jesus kind of gives this, this, the second part of his teaching. It's, it can be a little bit uh, tricky to understand. He says this, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, the, there's a bunch of interesting Greek words going on here that I'm not going to get into. But the, the point is that the healthy eye versus the unhealthy eye. The healthy eye is someone who is generous. Their eyes are open to the needs of others. The unhealthy eye has to do with being stingy, being envious of other stuff. A person who is coveting the things of this world. So the difference between the two eyes are what the eyes are focusing on what the eye is looking at, what it's open to or what it's closed to. And, and so if we open our eyes to the needy, if we open our eyes and therefore we are generous, Jesus says, light will flood our souls. Spiritual light will come in and we'll see everything properly as we should. But if we close our eyes to the needs of others, spiritual darkness comes in and we're unable to see reality as we should. So if the first part of Jesus' words were about getting our hearts right, this part is about getting our vision right. What are we looking at? And just as we have to stop storing up treasure on heaven, we have to stop looking at the things of this world. We have to close our eyes to greed and materialism. The Apostle John put it this way in 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... Love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, come not from the Father, but from the world. Notice he says the lust of the eyes. The eyes are, in understanding, are a window into the soul. And if we we lust after money and possessions, darkness floods in. And Satan and the world know this extremely well. After all, do you remember, how did Eve initially fall into sin. You remember? I think I have it up here for you. Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. Friends, this doesn't just happen back in the story of creation. This happens today. As we look at the things of this world, we can begin to fantasize Ooh, I want that. Oh, I'll look so good in that. I've got to order that. Oh, that thing, that's going to that's gonna bring us so much happiness. That's going to make my life so much easier. Man, I really need to upgrade my perfectly working phone. That phone that takes slightly better pictures than the phone I have now. <laughs> Guilty on that one. Advertisers know this well. That's why millions and millions of dollars are spent on advertising. If they can show it to your eye. You can begin to fantasize. I desire what is there. In these days, it's easier than ever. You have Amazon right in your pocket. Or perhaps Amazon has us right right in their pockets, right where they want us, showing us all the stuff of the world. We need to be careful where our eyes are looking. Perhaps we need to find ways to see less of this stuff, less of this advertising. And when we do see it, resisting that impulse, that that impulse by, oh, I need this. We've got to resist that. We have to close our eyes to the things of this world and practice the 10th commandment. Do not covet. Do not covet your neighbor's goods. The stuff people have, the stuff we see online. 
But after we close our eyes to greed, we have to close our eyes to greed, we also have to open them to the needs of others. We have to open our eyes to the needy. And that is how our eyes, that's how our souls get healthy. Many of you know this, but I just want to remind you of a few statistics. About one billion people are living on less than one dollar a day. About half the world's population, almost four billion, are living on less than five dollars and fifty cents a day. And especially our church we support, we've supported World Vision over the years. You're well aware of all the people in the world who don't have access to clean water. We know this. I'm sure you're aware of how difficult life is for refugees as they're fleeing their countries where violence is destroying their homes. You know, there was a, a great author and theologian, Ron Sider, who passed away this past week. And I was actually going to quote him before he passed away. Um, and if you don't know who that is, you really should. Uh, a very influential uh, theologian who is focused on justice for the poor. And as I researched this sermon, so many commentators were, you know, said, hey, back in the 1970s, 1980s, I read Rich Christians in the Age of Hunger by Ron Sider, and it changed my life. And he's updated it many times. Maybe consider, honestly, if you take anything, go pick that book up. And in honor of him, read, read it. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic book. But Ron Sider, he asked in his book, how many more luxuries should we buy for ourselves and our children when others are dying for lack of bread? That's a good heart check, isn't it? How many more luxuries should we buy for ourselves and our children when others are dying for lack of bread? How many more? I mean, based on common humanity alone, we ought to have compassion, right? But even more than this, many of the world's poor are our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. They're members of the same spiritual family. And as the Apostle John says, if anyone has material possessions and they see a brother or sister in need, you know, they see him, the eyes, their eyes are open. But if they have no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but, but with actions and with truth. You know, sometimes I think the, the widespread poverty that we're all well aware of, it can be overwhelming, and unfortunately that can freeze us into inaction. At least I've personally experienced that. But Craig Keener says, could not the abundance of this world's needs represent a call to keep on sacrificing? We have to fix our eyes on the needs of the world. We can't just close our eyes to what's going on. We have to stop comparing our lives to the rich people around us, to the people who live in this area, to people who might have a little bit more than us, and we have to start comparing it to the poor of the world. We have to close our eyes to all those pristine homes and nice things and open our eyes to those living in poverty. In fact, this is, goes back to the Jewish tradition in the Old Testament. Proverbs 28 says this, those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. And I think in an overwhelming world of poverty, we'd rather just close our eyes. I don't want to think about it. I don't want you to tell me about it. I don't want to be aware of it because I don't want to have to change how I'm living. In fact, if, you, if you're like me at this point, you, you might be feeling an inner conflict because you know, you know you need to stop storing up treasures on earth you, you, and your eyes are open to the poor but you know it's going to be demanding. It will demand that you do something. And there's part of us that, that really likes the pleasures and comforts of this world, and we want to keep them. But this is why we need Jesus' final counsel, where he says this, or in my words, despise the God of greed and devote yourself to God. Despise the God of greed and devote yourself to God. As Jesus says it, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, a few of you may remember the old translation of God and mammon with mammon capitalized because Jesus is pitting money and God as two rival gods. They're rival masters and we can only choose one. So in point, in point number one, we're getting our hearts right. In point two, 
We're getting our vision right. And now in point three, we're getting our will right. Who we will decide to serve, what we will decide to do. And something that really stood out to me for the first time in this well-known passage is the way that devotion to one leads to the hating of the other. Because if you, if, if you, you know, just thinking, if you, if you really love money and possessions, it's very possible you're hating the sermon right now. <laughs> but if you choose to serve God, you'll start despising greed, rejecting it, even hating it. If you want to follow God, you have to hate greed. You have to despise the God of greed and materialism. The Bible calls us to hate what is evil. So I was asking myself, does it look like I hate greed? And I have to confess, not enough. It doesn't look like I hate it. it. looks like I like it pretty well. But I want to deal greed a deathly blow in my life. It's a rival God. And Paul picked up on this when he called greed idolatry. It's idolatry. It's worshiping another God. And as Joshua said to the people when they were about to enter the promised land, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is it going to be earthly treasures and possessions or will it be God? Make your choice. So friends, this is how we live out the kingdom vision of Jesus. We set our hearts, we set on investing eternally. We open our eyes to the needs of others and we despise the God of greed and devote ourselves entirely to God. How do we do this? How do those of us who live in such generally affluent conditions, how do we follow the radical teachings of our Savior who had no place to lay his head? How do we do this? William Barclay, he says, one thing emerges from all of this. The possession of wealth, money, and material things is not a sin, but it is a grave responsibility. If people own many material things, it is not so much a matter for congratulation as it is a matter for prayer, that they may use them as God would want them to. You know, we, when we have extra, we automatically assume, oh, God has blessed me. I'm blessed. I have more, I have extra. And then we go on to use that on ourselves. But I want to bring you back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus turned everything upside down for us. When he said the people that we think are blessed are not those who are blessed. What we think is a blessing is actually the opposite oftentimes. In fact, in a, in a teaching not, not recorded in the Sermon on the Mount but recorded by the Apostle Paul, Jesus taught it's actually more blessed to give than it is to receive. The blessing of God is on those who are giving because he's empowering them to be givers. That's when you know you're blessed. When you're giving of the resources God has entrusted you with. So you have to ask, ask yourself, could I be accused of living out this teaching? Could I be accused as somebody who's storing up treasure in heaven, not earth? And if not, why do I call him Lord if I don't do what he says? So in obeying Jesus here, I cannot give you any law, any standard, any specific practice for you to follow. It has to be discerned with the Holy Spirit by prayer and conversation. And friends, it, this never ends. I feel like I need this reminder frequently, regularly throughout the year, because that, that is how deceitful wealth can get. It's not a one-time, okay, I've decided. No, I've got to take up my cross daily about this stuff. And I think it really boils down to two, two, two things, really. Simplicity and generosity. I'm going to live simply. I'm going to reject the materialism and the greed and the consumerism so I can free up resources to be generous and actually move my treasure from earth to heaven. So I reduce or I maintain my standard of living so I can increase my standard of giving. I mean, and you can find examples, even of, in our own church, of people who are doing all kinds of creative things to do this. Downsizing their homes, living communally, sharing rooms, downsizing to one car, cooking at home instead of going out to eat. And instead, they're giving their extra to, need, to the needs of the poor, to the needs of refugees, to the needs of the church, donating thousands and thousands of dollars to the kingdom of God. I want to close with an example of John, of John Wesley again, bring him back. 
He's the one who said not one in 500 Christians lived this out, but I believe he actually is the, one of the, the 500. While Wesley was a student at Oxford, he had just purchased some pictures for his room and was hanging them up. And one of the maids at Oxford knocked on the door. And it was cold in, you know, in Oxford, in England at that time. I think it must have been winter time. And the maid came without a proper winter coat on. She had something real thin. And Wesley reached into his pocket to get some of his money to give the woman to buy a coat. And he realized after buying those pictures, he didn't have enough left to buy this woman a coat and had to send her away back out into the cold. And that moment he became completely distraught. And he says, what, what is my Lord going to say? Is he going to say, well done, good and faithful servant? Will not this woman's blood be on my head for what I have just done? And so I think it, from that moment on, Wesley began to track and limit his expenses. And the first year that he records his income in his journal, his income was 30 pounds. And he lived on 28 pounds, and he gave the extra two to the poor. The next year, you know, Wesley started becoming a famous, famous speaker and preacher. And people wanted his sermons. They would buy his sermons. And the next year, he made 60 pounds. But he lived on 28. And he gave 32 pounds to the poor, over 50% of his income. In year number three, Wesley made 90 pounds. And he lived on 28 pounds, giving away 62 pounds or 69% of his income. In year four, Wesley made 120 pounds. And again, he lived on 28 pounds, giving away 92 pounds, 76% of his income. One year, Wesley records he made 1,400 pounds. And oh my goodness, he raised his standard of living to uh, the extravagant sum of 30 pounds. He gave away nearly 1,400 pounds that year, about 98% of his income. And I just want to ask, what if those who live in the affluent West, what if the majority or even all, what if all affluent Christians lived like John Wesley? What could we do? What good could be accomplished I mean, if we have this extra money, it's actually an opportunity for the kingdom of God. And I really believe that most of you, you want to excel at the grace of giving. Because of your generosity, together we've updated a 50-year-old church building. Glory to God. That's amazing. I just want to ask you, what do you guys want to do next? What's our next adventure? What can we do? If God's given us extra, do you, want, do you want to fund a bunch of refugee families? Do you want to pay for their apartments? Uh, do, maybe, do you want to start a faith covenant scholarship fund for our GPS kids so they can be supported to go to college? Could we fund a new church plant? Could we, could we support some new missionaries? Could we increase our giving? Pray about it and you tell me. What's our next adventure together with God? If we could live well like Wesley, we could do some exciting, exciting things. And that's why, friends, it is exciting. It's more blessed to give than to receive. In fact, and that's why it's exciting to be the church because when we pool our resources together, we can do amazing things for the kingdom of God. And I believe it's in you. I believe it's in us. I see it. And actually, I believe we could do it again for something else. So you tell me. I want to invite uh, John Herpelsheimer up. And I just want to give you a, uh, a few questions to think about as you apply this sermon. Am I acting like the sole owner of money or possessions, or am I acting like the Lord's trustee? Number two, how can I move? How can I even start moving treasure from earth to heaven? Or maybe you need the third one. How can I begin to close my eyes to greed and open my eyes to the needs of others in this community and around the world? And finally, maybe ask the Lord specifically, what is God calling me to do with what he has given me? Whether it be little or whether it be much, the point is, what does God want me to do with it? And then go and be obedient. I am uh, very humbled to stand here right now to lead us through this next part of the service because of what Nate has just shared with us today. Um, 
to be completely honest and upfront with you, this is, I am someone that has struggled with the concepts of greed and the idea of possessions and the idea of money and everything. And what I want to encourage you all on is as I look back and how I have come to the relationship of possessions and money, the greatest conversations I ever had were with my parents. They were the ones that instilled in me how am I supposed to approach money? How am I supposed to see it as a tool? Not as the way, not as the only source of joy or the source of excitement or things of like that. Because money is important. Money is necessary. We live in a culture and in a world that it is needed. But the idea of it is his and I am his steward of it. And I have gone through rocky paths and understanding of how do I engage with this. But what I come back to is our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He knows when the sparrow falls out of the tree. And he has promised us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. I've been reminded a lot lately of the song that says, he's got the whole world in his hand. And this part of the service is something that we kind of share together and we talk about, but I encourage you, go home, talk to your children, talk with your spouse, talk with your friends, sit down by yourself and figure out how am I supposed to further the kingdom of God Nate gave us some great ideas today. But I, I encourage us that this is not just a part of the service. Like, oh, yeah, we give back to God. No, 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 it's bigger than that. And so this part of the service today is huge. And take, think about it. Pray about it. I, I'll converse with you about my story. If you would love to hear it, I'd be more than happy to talk with you. But this part today is huge. So let us now join together and sing. We give thee but thine own. So please stand together as we sing. Uh, so if anybody haven't met yet, I'm Sky Johnston. And um, just thank you so much, Nate. What a beautiful um, vision that Nate just cast uh, for our church and for our community. So I just want to share one really unique opportunity that you might not know about and just sort of um, idea that Virginia and I have had our small groups talked about a little bit for maybe just, you know, humbly something for us to think about. Is this something that, that maybe we could do as a community? And this is what it is. Everybody, I think, knows about the war that's going on in Ukraine right now, but you might not know about this program that the government has sort of like sped up really quickly called United for, U United for Ukraine, U for You, which has opened up 100,000 parole positions for refugees to come to the United States. But the U.S. government's not spending any money on it. It's just giving the legal permission for two years for Ukrainian refugees to come to the United States. The government's sort of putting it into the hands of residents in America, citizens or just any legal residents in the country. If you sponsor a refugee family, then they can come here legally. And this started in April and it's going incredibly fast. We have a neighbor who has gone through the whole process twice. He's already sponsored two families. So on August 20th, um, at our house, you know, I was thinking we just open up the invitation for anybody to come to our house, talk with us about it, talk with our neighbor about it, and just sort of think about what, what we might be able to do. Um, because, you know, we, we've been sort of brainstorming about this and thinking maybe you're in a position financially, you're really not going to be spending the money, but, but somebody with the financial means has to sponsor the the family but maybe somebody else i don't have that that money but i have an extra room or i have a guest house in my yard and somebody else says hey i have the time to help this family 
go to the grocery store, get acclimated here, things like that. So, so we sort of have this vision for how this can be a really communal effort where we all pitch in in the ways that we can, and if, and if we work together as a community, uh, we can maybe do more than, than we can individually. But it's a really special opportunity to just minister to a family, to just, I mean, you know the situation in Ukraine, so I don't, I don't need to, um, you know, sort of tug at your heartstrings about that. But, um, you know, it's an opportunity just one-to-one -one directly, our resources for people face-to-face -face with, with a family, you know, um, in dire need. So if you're interested, you can give me a call. My number, I'll just say it really slowly, 630, if you're interested in writing that down, 630-890-3539. Or you can email me, my email address is my name, skyjohnston at gmail.com. Or, you know, let's just talk about it at, um, the retreat next weekend, um, you can talk to me or Virginia, and then we're looking at August 20th. So just let me know, you send me an email or give me a phone call and we'll set a time, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what the interest is and our neighbor Ron um, can come too. So it's just, it's just one really special opportunity that the government opened up 100,000 spots in April and they, they went pretty quick and now there's 75,000 that have already happened, but 25,000 more remaining um you know we're thinking too if if we have a lot of interest maybe it's something that we could branch out to other church communities uh in the area and maybe start something even even bigger in in the wheaton community with our christian brothers and sisters so um 630-890-3539 or just email me and uh it's a it's an exciting opportunity so thanks